Okay, can you hear me? This image here is known as the warming stripes and is showing us the change in global temperatures from 1850 through to 2021. The dark blue colors are showing colder temperatures than a baseline average from 1971 to 2000, whereas the dark red colors are showing us a very alarming level of warming. Just look at the way the global temperatures have warmed since the turn of the century. The WHO says that climate change is the single biggest threat to human health of the 21st century. Not only do we have the immediate threats from extreme heat and, and extreme uh, weather events, we also have the longer term threats from food and water shortages, and also an increasing risk of emerging infectious diseases. Let's take the example of dengue fever. In the 1970s, there were just nine countries reporting outbreaks of this disease, and that number has now increased to over 120 countries. The WHO estimates that around half the world's population is now at risk, and a recent study that we published showed that if global warming is to continue as at current levels, we'll see an additional 4.7 billion people at risk of this disease. So this increase is partly due to uh, increases in population, insufficient um, uh, environmental hygiene, but this is not happening just in the tropics and the subtropics. This is also happening in Europe. We've seen in the last few decades outbreaks of dengue and other mosquito-borne diseases in Croatia, in France, and also here in Spain. And this is partly due to international travel and trade, which allows people and mosquitoes to introduce this disease to new areas. Before the pandemic, around 100 to 300 uh, cases of dengue are reported in Barcelona from travelers arriving here. And in 2004, the invasive mosquito species, the Aedes albopictus, which is other than, otherwise known as the tiger mosquito, was introduced into Spain in San Cugat and has since been spreading throughout Spain. And this creates a real risk of the um, introduction of dengue here, particularly given climate change, which is allowing mosquitoes to establish themselves in higher altitudes and latitudes, and also extreme climatic events, which are changing the timing and intensity of these kind of outbreaks. So how can we use this climate information to help us predict the risk of epidemics and the emergence of these diseases in new areas? So I joined the BSC in January this year, and I established the new Global Health Resilience Team in the Earth Sciences Department. We're working within the Earth System Services Group alongside climate scientists to co-design decision support tools to improve the risk management of climate-sensitive diseases. We're an interdisciplinary team of um, mathematicians, meteorologists, epide epidemiologists, and data scientists, and we're working together to develop tools to translate global observations from satellites into local interventions to help guide public decision makers where to intervene, for example, to deploy fogging to prevent mosquito-borne diseases, or launch educational campaigns to alert people to clear their homes of potential mosquito breeding sites. We work across spatial scales from the global level right down to the local level, and we look to track um, changes in the risk of infectious diseases in the past. We issue seasonal predictions to help um, intervene several months ahead, and we also project changes into the future given different climate change and socioeconomic scenarios. Here we can see an example of uh, an indicator that was developed to track changing climate suitability for malaria in highland areas. And this is showing a really marked increase in the African highlands. And below we can see a map that was issued um, to predict the risk of dengue ahead of the 2014 World Cup. This is an example of one of the projects that we've been recently granted by the Wellcome Trust. This is a digital technology award where we're working with uh, public health agencies and humanitarian agencies in climate change hotspots in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Dominican Republic. And we're working to harmonize different data sets from uh, satellite images, 
drones, weather sensors, along with census data and disease surveillance to develop toolkits that can be used by these agencies to be ready to answer the most pressing questions related to the impacts of climate change on health. We're also now combining our knowledge in developing decision support systems in endemic settings and working together with scientists here in Barcelona to combine this with citizen science and smart trap tools to understand the human and mosquito interactions due to uh, the arrival of travelers infected with dengue and the increasing mosquito populations in the city. So as well as developing uh, tools to build resilience against emerging infectious diseases, I'm also involved in a global collaboration called the Lancet Countdown, which is tracking the impacts of climate change on health and also monitoring the way that governments are responding to climate change in terms of adaptation and mitigation me measures. And the goal of this project is really to shift from climate change being the public, the biggest public health threat of the 21st century to the biggest public health opportunity. Because responding to climate change is also good for our health through healthier diets, cleaner air, and also more livable cities. So I have the great honor of leading the new regional center of the Lancet Countdown on Europe, where we are focusing on the issues current to our region. This year, we published our first indicator report, which showed really alarming increases in the impacts of climate change from infectious disease threats, heat-related mortality, changing in the pollen season. And although there were some efforts to shift away from use of coal and towards renewable energies, this is really not enough. And the emissions of our region are unacceptable and causing millions of deaths each year. The Mediterranean region is particularly vulnerable. Look at the warming stripes for Spain. The level of warming is much higher than the global average. And we're seeing that in Spain, the trend in temperature-related mortality is double that than we see across the whole of Europe. And there are parts of the country that are becoming too hot to work or exercise safely. So what can we do about this? There are so many things that we can do in our day-to-day -day lives, which might seem obvious, but it's nice to be reminded. For example, by just moving away from consuming red meat and processed foods and eating more fruit and vegetables, not only are we decreasing the emissions that are released from the food systems, but we're also improving our health and reducing the risk of diseases like cancer and cardio uh, cardiovascular diseases. By using active transport, like cycling and walking, not only will we be contributing to cleaner air, but we're also improving our physical health and the risk of diseases linked to obesity. And also, to adapt to our new reality, we need to make sure that our balconies and terraces are clear from any flower pots or water containers, toys or anything that can collect water to avoid mosquito breeding sites and protect ourselves, our family and our neighbors from the emerging threat of diseases like dengue in our warming and globally connected city. That was pretty much all I had to say. I was just going to show you um, a video that we have about our research. You can find it on my Twitter profile. So thank you very much. <laughs>